If you can't see, the T-shirt says, I read the final chapter, God wins. <laughs> Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the hope that lies before us. And this morning, as we consider that hope together, we pray that you might stir it within us, that we might be shaped in how we live now, and you might keep our mind on him who promises to come and take us home. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. How big is your hope? If on Sunday uh, you were interviewed at church and uh, were asked, what is your hope? Uh, what are you looking forward to most as a Christian? What would you say? I suspect some of us at least would want to say salvation, the open declaration of forgiveness, seeing our Lord face to face and hearing him say those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's something glorious to look forward to, isn't it? To have reached the finish line, to have breached the tape, receiving the reward. That's, that's a wonderful, glorious hope, isn't it? Some might be looking forward to an end to the struggle, where our weakness and sin is not only defeated, but done away with forever, not even present anymore. And won't that be great? The final banishment of shame embarrassment and regret no need for them anymore what a magnificent hope that is or the great gathering with god's people from every nation tribe and tongue and from all history to stand there with abraham and moses and david the apostles augustine luther all the rest all rejoicing together in a salvation that is deeper and richer than we could ever have imagined. A generosity and a love that breaks out of all the boundaries our limited minds place around them. Or more specifically, a reunion with those who've been important in our own lives, but who have gone ahead of us to be with Christ. Loved ones, treasured family members, mentors, teachers, friends. It's often said that human beings can do without most things, but we cannot live without hope. Our hopes, our real hopes, not only nourish our lives, they shape them. They give us direction. They help us identify what is of most value now. How we live now is to a certain extent controlled by what we believe about our future. The deepest longings of the human heart are what really motivate us. One of the saddest things about the world around us is how so many people are satisfied with small hopes, fragile hopes, goals and dreams that crumble when you reach out to grab hold of them. Restless, anxious, striving, more frequently of late angry, they find that what they're pursuing is not really found where they thought it was, that every hero lets them down eventually. And there is still so much frustration, so much pain and sorrow and cruelty and injustice, and there does not seem to be any end in sight. But they'll stay on the same track because perhaps the next accolade will bring them peace or the next acquisition or the next bank statement or the next relationship. Perhaps the next messianic figure, the next president or prime minister will change the world in the way they want it to be changed. And we too can buy into those small hopes, more than we realise, can't we? As we turn to Revelation 21 and 22 this morning, we are given a vision of where the whole of human history, indeed universal history, has been heading. This is the destiny of the journey that began in Genesis 1 and 2. Here is the Christian hope in the most vivid colours imaginable. It's tangible, not just abstract or ethereal or spiritual. But before we dive into it, we need to remember two things that have informed us as we've taken that journey through Revelation uh, over the last semester. 
And the first is that this is a vision, not a photograph. We're meant to hear the resonances with the whole of the Bible leading up to this point, to pick up on the symbolism, but not to visualise it in detail in our minds. The details are important, but they contribute to a bigger picture and it's the bigger picture that should occupy our attention. And that's because of the second thing we need to remember. This book was written with a purpose to people undergoing intense persecution to call on them to keep going, to hold on. It is very explicitly, it points throughout the book, a call to patient endurance. And what they were being shown in these chapters and what we see this morning is what makes that endurance worthwhile. The Christian hope, the, the hope we're shown so vividly in these chapters is meant to feed endurance. There's a reason to hold on. The destination really is worth it. So once again, I want to gather the details of these chapters around the big picture and this time around two comings. The coming city in chapter 21 and the first part of chapter 22 and the coming Lord in the rest of chapter 22. And I'm hoping that you'll see that because of these two comings, there is a reason for us to hold on to, to live differently now because of what lies ahead for us then, to patiently endure no matter what is thrown against us. So first of all, the coming city. It's almost impossible to miss the first resonance with the rest of the Bible story, isn't it? In verse 1 of chapter 21 that Rose read for us, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Undoubtedly, we're meant to recall the very first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that, friends, is the most powerful indication that this is what has been in mind right from the beginning. God's purpose will prevail. In the final chapter, God does win. The end is not plan B. It's the one and only plan of God from the beginning. And there's something else we should notice right away. The end is not some disembodied escape from the tangible realities of bodies and earth, sky, and we'll soon see relationships. The Christian hope is not some kind of mystic existence, different in every way from life as we have known it now. The contours are the same, heavens and earth, but they are new. And both those perspectives need to be taken seriously the continuity with life as we know it, and the discontinuity. They are new. God hasn't scrapped the blueprint and begun again with something entirely different. As he created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, so we're shown a new heaven and a new earth. Not fluffy clouds and harps, but the solid, tangible reality of heaven and earth. Yet, this is not just the old world polished up and recycled. It is new. The first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And that should make us sit up and take notice. For I suspect that all of us, myself included, are far more invested in the first heaven and the first earth that makes any sense at all in the light of this reality. You see, in a very little while, really, they will be gone. They're not unimportant. And what we do in the midst of them is not unimportant. It's not wrong to enjoy them. It's entirely right that we should be responsible in how we steward them. But they are temporary. And we need to remember that and not be so caught up with them that we cannot let go. Well, the focus on the new heaven and the new earth quickly resolves into the new Jerusalem, which John sees coming down out of heaven from God in verse 2. This is what God has prepared as the centerpiece of the new creation. It's not a human achievement. 
It's not the result of progress and advancement or, or cultural evolution. It comes down out of heaven from God. And it is wonderful. The image of the city speaks of people together in community, in relationship, God's people in God's place, under God's rule. The Old Testament people of God, the gates are inscribed with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. The New Testament people of God, the 12 foundations of the city wall have inscribed on them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Here is God himself dwelling amongst his people, all his people, in fulfilment of all his promises and all God's people in right and proper relationship with each other. You see, the New Jerusalem is not just a set of empty buildings gleaming and in pristine condition like those, those so-called ghost cities in China. The image of the city is put alongside the image of the bride. This is the dwelling place that Christ has prepared for his people, for his precious bride. And nothing unclean will ever enter it, as John tells us in verse 27. And it will be filled only with what is glorious and honourable. It is a city that surpasses anything that ever existed in the first heaven and the first earth. But there is something else which is wonderful and even more so when we recognise the other echo from the Old Testament. This time from Isaiah 65. You might remember the verses. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. Isaiah was thinking in the first instance of the restoration of Israel after the exile, but the picture that he paints is of something the old city of Jerusalem could never be. Isaiah's prophecy is only really fulfilled at the end. Only at the end is weeping and distress gone forever. Only at the end will the wolf and the lamb graze together, as Isaiah went on to say, and the lion eat straw like the ox. It could never happen in the Old Testament Jerusalem or even in Jerusalem today. But the new city of God, prepared by Christ for his bride, where God himself dwells with his people, is a place of safety. The world of pain will be gone. Suffering in all its various forms will not only be banished, it will be forgotten. And that wonderful picture of God himself wiping away every tear from our eyes. And it is only when the city is in place, when the tears are wiped away, and death and mourning and crying and pain are gone forever, that we hear the most important words in this chapter. You might see them there in verse 6. They're often quickly skipped over in the rush to get to what's next. It is done. It's here. It has come. What lies at the heart of all the deep longings of the human heart, whether people realise it or not, it's coming, John tells his readers. Guaranteed and perfect. So hold on. Keep going. The end is worth persevering for. Well, the beginning of uh, Revelation 22 adds to the picture. The new city will not just be a place where death has been banished, it will be a place teeming with life. The river of the water of life, the tree of life. No need for light, artificial or natural light, because God himself is there and he will be their light. Hard to imagine, isn't it? But we're not meant to imagine it, but simply to recognise that God is there. God himself, right at the centre of it. He is the source of all life. And when he is involved, life overflows. And when he is involved, light is exceedingly bright. 
the coming city, all the promises of God caught up in this perfect dwelling place of God with his people, literally overflowing with life. The river of life flows right through the centre of the city and enjoying God's blessing on a monumental scale. The hope is solid and real and beyond the reach of anything that might want to snuff it out. It's coming. It's coming, so hold on. Don't give up. Endure to the end. It is most definitely worth it. And even more wonderful is the other coming, which ends not only this book but the entire Bible, the coming Lord. Three times in the second half of chapter 22, we hear the words, I am coming soon. The angel speaks these words that come from the Lord in verse 7 and verse 12. But there's a transition in verse 16. So by the time we get to verse 20, there's no shadow of a doubt who's speaking. This is the promise of Jesus. Surely I am coming soon. The emphasis is unmistakable, isn't it? Three times in just 15 verses. Whatever might have been happening then at the end of the first century, whatever might be happening for you now in our time and place, here is the sure and certain word of Jesus our Saviour. Surely I am coming soon. The return of Jesus brings all things to their conclusion. And it's another one of those things which seems to have dropped out of our common Christian conversation. Perhaps we've been spooked by the succession of people who've claimed that they're the returned Jesus or the crackpots who stand on street corners with signs telling you the exact date of his coming. But for whatever reason, it's a serious mistake to leave this great truth in the background. Here's the final word of the entire Bible and it's given to sustain us and to strengthen our hope. It is, of course, exactly what Jesus himself promised near the end of his earthly ministry. On the night he was betrayed, he said, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And when he was taken up into heaven, the two angels told the disciples, This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The Apostle Paul could write to the Thessalonians saying, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be always with the Lord. The return of Jesus, embodied, entirely glorious, when he will bring all things to their completion, judge the earth, gather his people to himself, proclaim his victory. This lies at the very core of the Christian hope because everything has always, is and always will be, even at the end, dependent on him. And he's the one who says, surely I'm coming soon. These final words in the book of Revelation were incredibly precious to those who in the first century were experiencing pain, suffering, tears, mourning, fear and uncertainty on a scale that we cannot really imagine. What kept them going? What enabled them to persevere, faithful to the end? What enabled the gospel mission to outlast the persecutors? and not fall into despair. Friends, it was this hope. Not something vague or ephemeral, but real and tangible and glorious. The city of ultimate safety and blessing is coming. It will come down out of heaven from God and all they had been experiencing would be overturned. No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. And God himself would wipe away every tear from their eyes. But more than that, and guaranteeing that, the one who had promised he would prepare a place for them and take them to himself, he's coming. 
the glorious conquering Lord of Revelation 1, who has the keys of death and Hades, the lamb standing as though he'd been slain, but now seated on the throne in Revelation 5, the one who sits in judgment in Revelation 20 and who promises living water, the spring of the water of life without payment in Revelation 21. He is coming and he is coming soon. So if you were interviewed this Sunday at church and the question was asked of you, what is your hope? What are you looking forward to most as a Christian? What would you say? How big is your hope? Is it as big as the hope held out to us in these verses? A hope big enough to sustain you in the midst of struggle and a hope clear enough to direct you in how you should live now. This is where it's all heading. This is what is promised and this will keep you going. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us these words, these promises, this glimpse into the hope, what lies before us. And we pray that on the basis of that hope, you might stir us to endure, that no matter what comes against us, no matter what the evil one throws at us, we might endure to the end and enjoy that safety in the city where you are present and where your son reigns. And this we ask in his name. Amen.